<clears throat> prove this thing. This is what we want to prove, and we're going to prove it by uh, complete induction. So we're now doing this proof by, by complete induction. So this is the ordinary complete induction because we don't have to hide anything, so we can put, uh, make all the hypotheses explicit. Okay, but what do we know? If we, if we got this already as a hypothesis, what do we know about fix? We were playing around with fix uh, when we were doing the domain theory, and that's one reason I, I uh, introduced it, so we could get to this kind of thing. So we know if you've got a function here and uh, you, you um, if you say apply f to fix of f, um, um, we're going to get fix of f. So this, uh, uh, and not equal, let me distinguish between this kind of equality and a really strong one, computational equality. I'll write that squiggle in there to mean these guys are interconvertible. So when you do fix of f, you're actually computing this way, right? That was the rule I showed you last time. If you take fix of f and apply it, you're going to substitute fix of f for the argument. Okay, well that is <laughs> all we have to know now, in or given that we have f in this type, <coughs> um, that, that conversion is enough to finish the proof. And um, the, when you do this in New Pearl, the uh, extract of this whole proof, so here's a QED, and you ask for its extract. What, what did you get when you extract? Well, you're going to get this, right? You're going to get, well, you're going to get fix, just the operator fix which has to be applied, <coughs> um, yeah. So <coughs> the extract up here is just, uh, of this whole theorem, is just the fix operator. So now you can say, well, that's what, <laughs> what this thing really <laughs> means, is fix belongs to it. <coughs> okay, so that seems weird, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, okay, so that's a very good question. So in the first case, <coughs> we, uh, so we're trying to prove this uniform complete induction, right? So we have complete induction in the theory. That's fine. So we've, we've got, that's a um, define, well, provable from standard induction. We could apply it. So we have ordinary complete induction with all of, uh, that I had written just beforehand, right? I wrote up the complete induction principle with ordinary quantifiers, without the brackets. Without the brackets. So we've got that. That's true, and, and we can use it <laughs> as soon as we expose these guys, right? As soon as we allow you to use them, we can then invoke the regular complete induction principle. So I meant this is a little mind boggling here, but. Um, well, if you keep asking questions, it'll be less mind-boggling. So we started out with complete induction, which I wrote down a few minutes ago. Okay, so, and that's a principle that looks like this. It starts off <coughs> for all, what did I use, M or something like that. No, for all N in N, blah, then we had for all X in N sub N and so forth. And that was written with ordinary quantifiers, and that has a recursor that goes with it. I didn't write it down because it's a bit hairy to explain, but that's primitive. What we wanted to do was prove now that this uniform induction principle is true. And we had to have an insight. I, I admit this is pulling a uh, cat out of the hat here to say, well, once you, but, but the insight is natural because you think of what you're trying to do here and you say, gee, as long as I don't have to keep track of the numbers that are being fed in here, the, 
it's very intuitive that the extract of, um, of, of this thing is the same as the extract of this, but without the numbers being kept around. And that is just iteration of f. So you're just repeating f over and over again. So it, the insight that we should use fix of f is actually pretty natural. Maybe I should have written the, uh, <laughs> writing the combinator for this is pretty uh, hard to explain. Well, no, it's not that hard to explain, but it would take, uh, th this is the kind of thing you all, I assign this to my undergrads as exercises. I say to them, and they do it. They don't complain too much. I, I say, here you've got standard induction, now prove complete induction, and they go away and they do it. Right? So you guys would have no trouble with that. But the insight, <laughs> this one looks like it's out of the hat, but it isn't. It's just reflecting on the structure of the complete induction and pulling all the integer stuff out of it, which we don't have access to. Okay, so maybe that's not so impressive yet. I mean, I don't know, it impressed me when, when New Pearl produced, Mark actually showed me, I, I didn't see that it would be this fix. But when he got it and he showed me New Pearl just extracted the fix, I was very pleased. But we're going to use this uh, for other things in a bit. Let me see. Are we going to, what are we doing next? Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? Uh, I, I don't want to pull the wool over your eyes. Are you re so <laughs> you can tell some of you are nodding and have gotten it and see, whoa, yeah, that's really cool. Others of you are puzzled. Some of you are trying to find the paper on the <laughs> Online, I don't know, Jim isn't here. Is it up there yet? Anyway, that's, okay, let's go, let's, if you're not uh, comfortable with it yet, we're gonna see an application of this whole thing in the, so wow, we, we're doing all right today, because <laughs> maybe you're not following. But um, here we are, we did polymorphic induction. So let's, uh, try to apply all this <coughs> to solving Smullyan's problem. So how many of you have uh, looked at the problem? Okay, so uh, I'll bring uh, the rest of you up to speed on it then a little. We'll save all this. So the reason I think, um, well, this problem is interesting to me because we can use this complete induction that I just showed you with a fixed point <coughs> to solve it. And I think this, uh, this kind of quantifier is very interesting and you can use, once you get comfortable with it, you'll find all kinds of uses for it in your work. But here is a practical use. This problem from Smullyan's book was driving us nuts for a long time. And Mark all of a sudden just solved it exactly right. So what was, what is Smullyan's uh, problem? <laughs> It's actually our problem, so it's Smullyan's uh, hidden computation. <coughs> so let's take a look at what he does in this logic book that I like a lot, the first order logic. Now he's, he's actually just on page 10, and the first few pages are simply defining formulas and things like that. So we, we could give a really nice inductive de definition of formula. <clears throat> so we'd say, well, that's some kind of a recursive type here where you've got, say, um, let me just follow the, the notation that I use in the paper. Let's say, oh dear, that was like right down the sewer. Darn. Hmm. It wouldn't be so bad, but it's my only paper clip. All right, so uh, let's see what happens here. So for formulas, well, let's, I'll, I'll just make up what it is. So we have a recursive type where you say, all right, we have variables. They come from the atoms. So you have um, a list of variables like that. Then you're gonna have uh, an and constructor that takes, <coughs> um, so if you have x and y formulas, you're going to take x 
and y will be a formula x or y, <coughs> x implies y. <coughs> so you, uh, you have the ordinary <coughs> recursive data type. And if you've got a formula here for x, a formula, uh, we can define the variables of x as a type. And we want to define then the evaluation, a Boolean evaluation, say v, v0, some initial Boolean valuation of the variables of the formula x. And with all that, we'd like to compute a function, say the Boolean value of the formula given <coughs> that evaluation. And we want this to be an element, this is going to be some element in the type Booleans. And we know how to do this. I mean, it's trivial. In most logic classes, you just write this down, right? You so you'll write a recursive procedure here. You'll have cases. You'll, these will be, uh, <coughs> so cases on x, if it's a variable, then you're going to apply v0 on x. Um, if it's a not, oh, I forgot to put that not up here. But anyway, you'll, you all know how to do th those recursive types. So if you had a not q here, then you're going to return the Boolean not operation on the formula q. If you have an and, say of a q1 and a q2, then you're going to return the Boolean and operation on q1 and q2, where these mappings, the Boolean, say, and, and so forth, those are just the mappings from Booleans cross Booleans to Booleans, right? So you have to know that first. But once you have that, here's the recursive definition of valuation. Yep. Can you show me the implementation of the valuation to uh, so I'm doing this recursively, right? So I'm taking the not off, and I'm looking at the formula that's under the not. And, then, and so I can apply the B not to, to um, ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, right. So um, right. <coughs> so if we, yes, sorry. We're going to do B val then on this uh, Q and V0. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so we had that, and we're going to here B val. Yeah, it wasn't much of a recursive function before. Uh, Q1, V0, B val, Q2, V0. Okay, so you, you get the idea, right? We just write this recursive function down. That's it, and the students nowadays, computer science students, they love it. They write it down in ML and think, okay, this is it. So probably one reason I focus on the Smullyan problem is I first show them this, and then they're reading the book, and they say, yeah, but wh what's he doing? He, he didn't give us this Boolean valuation. So what, what does Smullyan do instead? So he's going to implicitly construct this Boolean valuation out of um, much more general discussion of, uh, uh, of, of the whole process of Boolean valuation. So first, if you, uh, well if you haven't seen the, if you haven't looked online, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll give you a uh, a rough idea of how he gets started, and then we'll go into the interesting part, teasing out the algorithm. But um, basically, he says, okay, what I have to define is something called a Boolean valuation. And that's going to be <coughs> something that takes any formula, so here you're going to have x, a formula, and uh, it's going to take any v0 there. And um, so he, he doesn't write it down like this. He can't see what all, what all of his parameters are. But he's going to say, basically, there is a thing here, a function called a Boolean valuation that has to satisfy these 
conditions. So he writes them down. He said, okay, the Boolean valuation of a variable, and when you're, when you're looking at a variable x, you better apply v0. <coughs> when you're looking at the not, you're, so you have not q, you're going to take this function that he said we already had, and you're going to apply that to f of um, f of the q. But he's trying to define this thing. So he's saying, I'm going to define for you a function that's the Boolean evaluation, and here's the property it'll have to have. It's kind of like this, you know, you have to be able to use it recursively. But he just uh, gives the conditions for it without actually giving you an algorithm or anything else. He said, these are the conditions you need to write a Boolean evaluation. So now let's attack this thing first. Let's write down, um, and this is uh, the easy part, the way we would do that Boolean valuation in um, the way we did it in this article. Okay, so, and um, yeah, I guess that's, well, I need a couple more definitions here before we can do that. I have to tell you just a couple of things so, let's see, is this? Okay, so we've got these ideas that I just mentioned up here. We've got what a formula is as a recursive data type, but he also needs the idea of subformulas. So he writes sub of x <coughs> as um, a set of all x's in formula <coughs> such that. Um, whoops, let's say y's, sorry, the y's in formula such that y, he writes it this way, is a subformula of x, including x itself. So we define subformulas, we define, well, the variables of x I already did. And let me write down his theorem over here first and then explain parts of his theorem. So at the bottom of page 10, he writes a theorem like this, page 10 uh, theorem. theorem. And this is his main theorem. He says, okay, for every x a formula, <coughs> for every v0 mapping the variables of x, so he's nicely using uh, dependent typing there. Um, it says for that, there is going to exist <coughs> a function from the subformulas of x into the Booleans, which is a Boolean evaluation, a, a Boolean valuation. So now I, I already told you informally uh, what, what he meant, but I'll write out now the precise definition over here where we're starting to give the preliminaries for that idea of what a Boolean valuation is. So to do that, <coughs> we're going to define a function called extend. So extend is going to take v0, it's going to take, <coughs> um, it's going to take uh, this function, it's going to take a valuation and it's going to take a subformula a formula. So let me tell you what the types are here. So v, v0, we've got the type for already. Q is going to be a valuation, and P is a subformula. And here is uh, our way of turning <coughs> that into a precise definition. And we'll do cases, and this is going to look very much like we, what we wrote a, minute, uh, a, a while ago. So we'll do cases on P. So if variable, uh, P, uh, well let, let's say the variable is V out of that. We're going to take V0 on V. If we have Q1 and Q2 as subformulas, <coughs> um, 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 yes. So then we're going to take the Boolean ands of Q. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that's a that's a G. Boolean evaluation of G on Q1, 
<coughs> and G on T2. And you know, it's going to be um, the same for or and so forth. I don't have to write all that down, but Boolean or uh, on G of T1, G of T2. So <coughs> what we have here is that this is a Boolean evaluation on subformula. So it's, a, it, it's going to um <coughs> have the property that it's assigning values. So it's mapping um, the, um, it, it evaluates a subformula to a Boolean. Okay, so now uh, that's a parameter coming in. This is, you know, you know so that per that comes in as a parameter. We get v zero. We get an evaluation on um, well that's just given to us. It's a mapping that goes from subformulas <coughs> into booleans. So G maps subformulas of x into boolean. Okay, so now we're going to give <coughs> a precise definition of evaluation, this concept over here. And instead of calling it Boolean evaluation, I'll just call it valuation. So we'll say <coughs> evaluation of a formula X <coughs> with assignments V0 is this function F that has the property <coughs> that this is true if and only if for every subformula of X, um, F on that subformula is the extension. So it, it, it um, is that operator we called extends of V0, F, and P. Okay, so here's our extend map. So uh, if you can read this, well, I, I hope I give you time to stare at that. So here's the extend. So this is actually transforming what Smolian says, and it's a pretty um, direct reading of, of what he says a Boolean valuation is. So how do we understand that? What is a Boolean valuation? So here's F appearing in it. We say, so F is a Boolean valuation if for every subformula of X, F on that subformula extends <coughs> the uh, application of F, this thing here, this Boolean thing, <coughs> extends itself. So you can argue that <laughs> what, what Smullyan was writing is that a valuation is, um, well, let's see, how did I, I want to say? It's a function that correctly extends itself. So I think that's a good way to put it. So F correctly <coughs> extends itself. Okay, so that, I mean, it's getting a bit, uh, closer to computation here, but it doesn't tell you the algorithm yet. We don't actually know how to compute this thing, but we at least have a good definition that uh, formalizes what Smullyan wrote on page 10. And we've got it down very formally, okay? So evaluation is a function that assigns <coughs> truth, that, that extends truth values um, according to these conditions on a Boolean valuation, <coughs> so it extends itself, um, and you can think what it's doing is it starts at V0, um, gets the values at V0, and then works its way back up the tree, and uh, once it can do the whole formula, X, which is a subformula of itself, it's done. All right, so if... Uh, well, I don't know. What do you think of that? I, I think that's actually a fairly elegant description of what Smullyan had in mind. And it's getting to be computational now. We can see that we've got some chance of actually proving a theorem like this for every formula, for every 
valuation of those, that there will exist a mapping, so now we'll just call that evaluation, from subformulas to Booleans. But there is something a little disconcerting about this. This is what he says, basically. What do you find uh, a little upsetting about it, maybe disconcerting? This isn't the way you would want to teach it, uh, to you think, but uh, it's not so bad. Yeah, what do you think? So, no, not too many people, yeah. Yeah, uh, he <coughs> he'll be able to prove it's unique. That's a good question, but he does prove it's unique. And in fact, uh, just before this, he has a little argument that says, if there is one of these, it's unique. So he gets that first. And we could actually, to be a little more, uh, you might be happier if he had said that. Essentially, he put that up earlier. But look what he's doing. I mean, compare this to what we wanted to write down before. He's just getting a function, right? So here you bring in a formula and you bring in a valuation, and what does he produce? A function. So this doesn't look so good. Like th the students, if they understood, if they got this far in understanding it computationally, they'd be very upset. They'd say, wait a minute, you have to build a valuation for every formula? That's how you're gonna do this? So what is Smullyan doing here, and how does he get by with it? I mean, how come lots of people like this book? I like it a lot. How come undergrads understand it? They come away, they know, how, they know what this is. But they're not sensitive to the computational thing here. They're saying, wow. If they were, they'd say, this is a pretty horrible way to go, having to build a valuation function for every formula. But he, he, I don't think he had these uniform quantifiers in mind. But you can fix this really easy. You can turn this into a good computation. And this is kind of a cool thing. I know it's tedious that we've gotten down into a lot of details. But Smolian is a magician. And he has in mind a computation that he's buried. He's hidden down in there. And many mathematicians are that way, right? He's not the only one. They, they tend to like very abstract, general ways of thinking of things. And to find the computation, you have to do a lot of work. And here, mm, we did some work. But now let's try to prove this theorem. And I can see I, I shouldn't go into great detail, especially since it's uh, in the paper. You'll be able to see the details. But I want to at least show you how we can use the fixed point operator to turn this into a good computation. And you can see it intuitively, right? The thing I just mentioned gives you the intuition behind how this is going to work. You're basically taking this V0 and starting at the leaves and then just crawling up to the subformula itself. That's all that's going on. And so if you can find the right thing to iterate, it's going to be fine. It, it'll be quite a good function because all you need is this V0 to get started and everything else goes um, <coughs> according to this, according to this extension uh, idea. Okay, so let me try to finish this more quickly than I had in mind. Um, so how do we prove this formula? Let me just sketch to you how we're gonna prove his main theorem. Uh, I should leave, I should go back. This. We're actually gonna prove it. Whoops, I did that. So <coughs> we're going to use uh, this complete induction principle to prove that formula. And we'll just write it down one more time here. And uh, OK, so let's see what we have to do. So <coughs> we're starting with uh, a formula. We got the formula. We use the dependent type to get us this v0 from the variables of the formula into the Booleans. <coughs> and now we're going to claim there exists a function <coughs> that takes the subformulas of x into the Booleans <coughs> and is a valuation, <coughs> a 
and I can keep the order right of x to be 0 and uh, x. OK, so that's what we have to do. And the method of doing this is we have to uh, put a bound on the iteration. We're going to be iterating some function, but we have to know what we're going to iterate the uh, v0 function in this way that extends it. But we've got to know how far to iterate it. And that will be on the depth of the formula here. So in order to prove this, we're going to need a definition of a bounded kind of Boolean evaluation. And this is the last of the tedious definitions. Let me just write this down quick, and we'll have all the material needed to do the theorem. So we're going <coughs> to, in order to get this to work by induction, we need some kind of bounded Boolean evaluation. So we'll define that over here. We'll say that um, um, we've got a bounded BV valuation um, of n, x, v0, and f means, that's true if and only if, for every p a subformula of x, um, where the length, uh, say the, the depth of the formula x is less than n, we have that f of p <coughs> extends, uh, I should write it down here so we don't run into that theorem, extends f v0 p. That don't implies, let's make room for that over here. Uh, so f of p extends um, f v0 p. <coughs> OK, so this thing <coughs> we're going to be able to prove. Um, th this is the thing we're going to prove by induction, by that complete induction we had before. And once we have this, we just stick in the depth of this variable x in the formula, and we're going to be able to um, build that Boolean valuation. So the whole key to the thing is proving this formula here, this lemma. <coughs> we're going to prove this by um, complete induction. So prove it by complete induction. So <coughs> the thing, and we know what's going to come out of the complete induction, right? That is a fixed point operator. And to make a long story short, all, all we have to do when we're proving this is um, make the quantifiers here all uniform and then um, take, in, in the induction hypothesis, we're going to have this guy, this formula, um, let, let me write it down here in a nice way. So <coughs> in proving this formula, we're actually going to have the assumption, our induction hypothesis in the proof. So proof, we'll have this induction hypothesis that F maps subformulas of X into the Booleans and is a valuation on n, x, v0, and f. And then we're going to use that. <coughs> we're going to be trying to prove uh, the conclusion of the, of the lemma here. And OK, so I'll just give you the key step of this. So we're going to use. Um, we use the function um, lambda p extends um, 
extends V0 F of P. <coughs> and apply, so, so this is the thing that we want to apply the fix to. So in the complete induction, we've got this formula over here. <coughs> and uh, by, oh, let's see. Yeah, so <clears throat> what we have to get in the conclusion of the thing is this extension. So we know that we can take the function f there and <coughs> um, for we'll take this for, th this is the f, so if we apply fix to that thing, we're going to get an element of, um, of the conclusion. Right. <coughs> okay, so anyway, we'll... Um, apply a comp induction <coughs> to this lambda um, um, yeah just a minute, I'm sorry I'm Yeah, so I see if I can. Oh, okay, so I, I said in here that I want to apply fix to the function lambda f lambda p extends. Um, v0 f p. <coughs> okay, so according to the complete induction, if we apply fix to this thing, uh, that gives us the conclusion <coughs> of this theorem, and that is going to be the extract um, Uh, <coughs> th that extract will prove this theorem. And I realize I'm not getting, <laughs> not making this very clear, which is a good thing I decided to put the, uh, the paper up on the web. So you can read the details of this. Um, and anyway, the, the upshot is we take the <coughs> bounded induction theorem, which has an N in it. So we're doing, uh, in we, we've got an N to do the induction on. And by applying complete induction, we just take the hypothesis here. The, in the hypothesis, we've got a function. We've got just the one we need. So if we apply um, the result of the induction <coughs> formula to, <coughs> to the hypothesis, we get exactly this fix applied to extends. And when you think of how that fix works, let's move it out here. So we're taking fix on this guy. And we can see what we're doing is iterating this function. Uh, and, and that's exactly Smullyan's intuition. So we start off with, uh, the, with a function that's just V0. And we keep iterating it in this theorem just uh, to the depth of the formula. And that's going to give us the computational uh, the computational content of Smullyan's proof. So yeah, I, I know I didn't do uh, such a good job on this because I was hoping I would, I don't know, I was hoping I'd do a better job. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah. Can you just clarify using big pictures of it? So when you write for all, yeah. that is like a really kind of Well, <coughs> what we did here, the key thing, yeah, the, the key lemma 
in all this is the complete induction number, right? That's what allows me to see. So in, intuitively, <coughs> summarizing this thing intuitively, Smullyan, when he wants to get this, he writes a little uh, parenthetical remark saying, it's pretty clear how you get the Boolean valuation. You start with V0, work your way up the tree. And so you're thinking, aha, uh -huh, that's the algorithm. But he doesn't give you that algorithm. So we need a way to find it. Well, what is that way? It should be a method that just iterates on this component. All right, so you, you want to take, okay, here's the uh, beginning valuation. Just keep iterating it until you've done it enough, till you get to the top. So here, this tells us how far we have to iterate. And the cool thing about the complete induction is we don't have to keep track of that. We don't have to count it or anything. We just say it's going to work because you'll get to the fact that you have x as it's a subformula of itself, and then you finish the evaluation. Okay, so the, the ideas are not too bad. What was throwing me, was slowing me down and making me nervous about this is I didn't realize, like, ugh, there's just a lot of notation. If you're trying to do it at the board instead of in a, in a uh, uh, transparency, you start thinking there's just too much. I don't want to want to do that. I thought it was manageable, but the intuition is cool, nevertheless. And I think if you remember just these bits, like we used a new induction principle here, fairly cool induction principle, right? It doesn't, and wh why is that going to be useful? Well, so here you might think, well, he made a big deal of it. But I did because this kind of induction is incredibly useful. So where is it going to be useful? Here you've seen one example, but what's the generic thing? Why is that a good induction principle? Well, any time you use induction, say, as an index, you're just using the numbers as an index. It's not computational content you want. You're just saying, OK, if I count this thing up, I'll get to where I want to be. But I don't care what the number is, really. I just need a way of doing some kind of inductive argument to say it will eventually terminate. But it's not part of the evaluation here, right? Nowhere in this do we really need the numbers in the evaluation. So when you see that, when you see a problem that says, aha, I've got to use n as an index to do something, but I don't want to keep it around. I don't need the number around. You can save a tremendous amount of computational resource by saying, OK, I'll use polymorphic induction. I'll use these uh, intersection quantifiers, which throw away the number for computational purposes. But let me keep it in there if I've got to do some reasoning inside, like we had to do here. We needed actually to get a hold of the n, but not for computation, right? We never use this n <coughs> in, in the extract, in the computation. So if you've got that situation, and we've seen it, by, by the way, the amazing thing. So um, the first time I saw this, I thought, wow, that's amazing. Because all, all of a sudden, we solved this Smullyan problem that had been bugging us for a long time. But furthermore, we got a fast extract. This was blindingly fast. Boom, it was just evaluated. So we started pondering what I just told you. Why is this working? And we said it's working because whenever you've got an induction that doesn't actually use the numbers for values, you can do this trick. So we started thinking about our library. We have 50,000 theorems in the library. And we said, I wonder how many of those are in there. And Mark said, one way to find out, and I thought this was crazy, but he said, well, look, why don't we do this? Let's just replace all of our quantifiers everywhere in the library by uniform quantifiers and run the proofs again and see what happens. So he did it. And he said, wow, this is pretty cool. We just got 400 new theorems that just worked with uh, new quantifiers. I said, wow, that, that's pretty neat. And he said, and some of them are useful. They're now already being scooped up into the uh, work we're doing. So he said, and some of the others are easy to fix. So he spent another couple of days, and he said, here, for the, some of these, we just need to 
change the tactics a little bit to take uh, into account some structure. So he did that, and the next week he got 1,500 new theorems, all working. You didn't have to, you know, he didn't touch anything. He just ran these tactics with the uniform quantifiers. And now he's up to 4,000 theorems of this form <coughs> that are just being grabbed up into our theorem proving uh, efforts whenever it, <laughs> well, and the, uh, the tactics just look in the library. They say, can I use uniform induction here or uni uh, any, any kind of uniform? And they try, and if it works, great. So that's why I wanted to at least make you aware of it and give you some rough idea. I probably should have stayed with a rougher idea of it. So this turns out then to be amazingly useful. So 4,000 new theorems. That's without us doing much, right? And those theorems are now being, uh, as I mentioned, incorporated into um, all the other theorem proving we do. But furthermore, it shows that this idea that Smullyan had, even though when you read it, and I hope some of you will try that, you won't get anything out of this lecture unless you go read the page 10 there and try to figure it out for yourself. Say, what was he talking about? And what you'll see is that Mark actually figured out with these three lemmas I showed you exactly what he was talking about. But <laughs> the paper that we reference where Stuart Allen and Matt Fluitt and I worked on this for, I don't know, it's an embarrassing amount of time. We tried everything under the sun to prove this, uh, this Smullyan theorem, including using the most powerful type we had at the time, which was uh, our very dependent function type. And if you read in the paper, you'll see how far we got with it. It looks okay, but not anywhere near as neat as this. So here's a research problem that comes out of this, out, out of this effort of reflecting on it. So if you go to the paper we wrote, um, I think it's called Allen 03, in there, we tried to use this very dependent function type to express the very dependent functions. This is really a pretty hairy type. Um, I won't try to say much about it. It's just you can have something like this. You, so you, here's a regular function type. It goes from A into B. And uh, th this kind of, and if you've got a function in that type, it doesn't use itself when it's trying to uh, describe the, the output. But in Jason Hickey's very dependent function type, you can do this. You, you put another colon here, put the whole thing around with X and then F in it, and you've got a type that says, okay, I'll take the function that's in this type and I'll use it in the range but to do that, you have to have an ordering here, some kind of well ordering to say you don't use values of the function in the range um, that, that you haven't, uh, well, you, you have to be able to order them so that in the definition here, you don't use values that are ahead of, uh, um, a, ahead of your proof. So this is a, is a pretty complex type. And now having done uh, replaced it with this intersection type. Mark conjectures, but we don't have time to work on this, so it would be interesting if one of you did. The conjecture is any place where we've used very dependent functions in the past, we could get rid of them using the uniform uh, type constructor. So conjecture all uses of very dependent functions are, um, are, um, can be done with uniform quantifiers. So that's an interesting conjecture. Say it can be done yeah, with uniform quantifiers. And we now we have one example of it, <coughs> and you'll see it if you uh, care to read this Allen uh, paper. You'll see how we did it with very dependent functions. And then you can, and, and we got a pretty good extract, but this is much better, much cleaner. So how are we doing? 
when am I supposed to stop? Where, where, where? Right about now. <coughs> okay. Uh, all right. So let me tell you. I, I get. So here I was going to talk a little bit about other types we have. Here's one of them. But let me tell you one more. And I probably should have talked about this stuff instead of that. But here's one more intersection type. This showed you the power of intersections. There is one more intersection type that we've been using a lot from Kopelov. In, uh, this was Lix um, 03, 2003. He defined um, a type called the dependent intersection. So it's a generalization of this intersection. Uh, so it goes like this. <coughs> you intersect, indexed by A, um, a family of types, B of X. So what you've got in this intersection are the elements of A that actually appear in this B of X. And the cool thing about that type is you can use it in an almost straightforward way to define dependent records. So if you want to have a record type that does something like this, let's say in comes a type uh, A, and you want to build an operator on it, say uh, <coughs> from A2 into A, so you've got a binary operator there, and you want to say that it's an associative operator, it's going to have an axiom here, it says associative uh, F. And you want to have an identity in there, an ID of type A, which you want to call, uh, have an identity axiom for it, ID ax. So you can build a type like this, a dependent <coughs> record type, where the fields, as you progress, mention all the previous fields. Very cool type. And the, we build it with this dependent intersection. So you take this binary thing and you just apply it over and over again and you can build up dependent records like this, which is a wonderful data type for algebra, right? Here I'm suggesting that we're building, say, a monoid. Here's the carrier. Here's the operator on the monoid. Here's the axiom, which is a type telling us what it is. Here's the identity. Here's the axiom for it. So there it is, uh, just from intersection types again. You take you slightly, well, significantly more expressive dependent intersection, and you can build this. And this type we use everywhere. This is how, if we define uh, algebraic structures, we do it like that. If we define event structures, we do it like this. Because uh, when you're trying to build them as just ordinary uh, products and iterating a product, you can't actually get the dependency here. You have to have the field selector names that tell you I'm going left, right, right, left, and this is far more uh, handy. So anyway, I did want to get that thing mentioned. So here we have dependent intersection and dependent records. I won't talk about processes, but our system has a type of processes, communicating asynchronous uh, processes. And because uh, of that, we can actually reason about protocols and um, do processes as uh, proofs. So anyway, the point of this lecture here, when you're looking back on it, is to show that there are new type constructors, like uniform quantifiers, dependent inter uh, intersection types, dependent intersection types, that actually make extraction faster, that make expressing ideas like um, algebraic structures very convenient. And I think that's not going to be the end of the process. The conclusion I would draw here is that we're going to be extending, us, this community, to we're going to be finding new types, new evaluation forms, new ways of piecing all those things together in a systematic way, as we heard from Pierre-Louis and Hugo and from the people doing logical relations. So the future looks pretty
pretty lively and bright. I don't think we're at a stage where we actually know what the definitive type theories are going to be like. They're going to get richer all the time, and they're going to get cleaner and easier to put together. Okay, so that's the story. And uh, at least I wrote a paper on the stuff that we, or we, we put up a paper there. I'm sorry that got so tedious, but uh, that's next time I won't try to write such tedious proofs. But I hope you got the point of it, right? That we uncovered a really interesting computation. Okay, thanks for your patience.